Good morning and welcome to this forum on Julian of Norwich. I have to say it's a strange time that we are living in with the cancellation of church and of schools and many of us facing being out of work. And uh, before I begin, I just want to reassure you that uh, I and Lisa and the staff are all working uh, really hard to see how we can best respond to this crisis and even make it a into a chance for the parish to grow, uh, to grow in our sense of faith and our relationship with one another, and uh, grow in our in our sense of what love is and what love calls us to. So thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for uh, abiding with us as we make decisions, and we certainly look forward to being back together again as a parish and a normal parish life as we've known it. Now, I did most of the presentation for this, uh, or the, the uh, preparation for this presentation on Julian of Norwich for our Lent program. And although it, it's definitely not polished now, and, and uh, this is more an exercise in being present and not perfect, uh, I do wanted to share it with you because I did put time into it, and because Julian of Norwich, I think, is one of the most extraordinary figures uh, in the Christian spiritual pantheon, the Pantheon of the Saints, and uh, I think she has something to say to this moment in our parish life, actually. Um, as we'll see, Julian lived through the Black Plague, through times of great turmoil and disruption, and I think her spirituality is in many ways a direct response to that. So um, I share this out of my love for Julian. I think she's an extraordinary figure, as do a great chorus of theologians and uh, writers and poets all over the world. Um, uh, but I also think she has application to the peculiar shape that our Lent journey has taken this year with the coronavirus, our self-quarantining, our social distancing. And maybe I'll say a word about that. Many of us are going to be more alone than we have been. And uh, Julian lived a life of radical aloneness, as, as we'll see, as a solitary, an anchorite living alone, a vowed life alone next to her church. And I think there too, her spirituality can really speak to us about how we can pray and grow in our relationship with God through the solitude and the, what is it? time alone that we are going to have. So with that being said, I'd like to begin this presentation, Journey to Jerusalem, uh, Julian of Norwich, and uh, share with you to begin with uh, this, this uh, statue of Julian, which is on the west wall of Norwich Cathedral. Uh, and it's not just me who thinks Julian is the best thing since sliced bread or since uh, communion hosts. Um, there's a great writer named Martin Thornton, and uh, Martin wrote, I'm sorry, this is, good. This, this is not working all of a sudden. Martin wrote that Julian represents the quintessence of English spirituality, and by that he meant Julian integrates all the various kinds of spirituality, from the kind that sits in silence on God to the kind that loves Jesus and his humanity, to the kind that's more emotional, to the kind that's more cognitive, Julian wonderfully combines it all. And part of the way she does that um, is that in her book, The Revelations of Divine Love, Julian uh, isn't just writing a theology for us or writing a spiritual primer or instructions about how to pray or how to go about being a good Christian, but she's telling us her own journey. Uh, she's telling us about her own experience of God, how that was radically challenging to her, and how that led her uh, to a new sense of herself and of God and what Christian spirituality is in the world. So she, she creates a new theology around her experience. Martin Thornton said she's the quintessence of English spirituality, and Thomas Merton, the great monk of the 20th century, said, Julian is without doubt one of the most wonderful of all Christian voices. 
she gets greater and greater in my eyes as I grow older. And whereas in the old days, I used to be crazy about St. John of the Cross, I would not exchange him now for Julian if he gave me the world and all the Indies and all the Spanish mystics all rolled up in one bundle. I think that Julian of Norwich is with Newman the greatest of English theologians. And uh, I hope that in this, in this presentation we'll be able to see why that is and uh, how we might appropriate her for our parish life. Now, this next slide is a picture of me. Uh, that's where I was at about, I'm guessing around 33, 35 years old as a monastic in the Order of Julian of Norwich. And that picture was taken when I was in the middle of Scotland uh, leading retreats and uh, actually recording uh, my first and only ever uh, CD of spiritual reflections. And behind that you see my text of the Revelations of Divine Love heavily marked up because I have been studying uh, this text for 20 years. And this version of it is the one we were given when we became novices in our very first year of the monastic community. So I've been with Julian now for 30 years, heavily with her for about 25 years, and she really is the, 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 the ground of all my spiritual reflections, my home base in the Christian spiritual life. And uh, in this talk, I kind of have to get ready to uh, leave a lot out that I love, that there's so much that I'd love to share about her and so much that's amazing about her. But I think we're just gonna try to hit some of the key points and, uh, and give you a chance perhaps to reflect on what they might mean for your own life. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to offer an introduction to Julian and talk a bit about her book, The Revelations of Divine Love, and then look with you at three key passages which show something of the uniqueness of Julian and the essence of her message. Now, some background on Julian is that she lived uh, in probably in Norfolk for her entire life and probably in Norwich from about 1343 to seven to 14 15 or so and um, Norwich at that time was not a very happy place to be uh, it was one of the worst centuries of English life ever uh, Julian uh, experienced the Black Plague which wiped out a third to a half of Norwich and Norfolk the county around Norwich uh, still, if you go there today, if you go to Norfolk and drive through the countryside, you can find the ruins of villages that were entirely decimated by the plague and never re-inhabited. Um, and in our time of the coronavirus, um, I think Julian would know what it's like to have your whole life turned upside down in a truly appalling way by the sickness and death of almost everyone around you the death of at least a third to a half of the people in your life. Um, beyond that, there was constant famines, there were peasants' revolts, there were um, uh, pre-Protestant ideas being floated who got their, uh, the people who supported those, those ideas martyred. Um, it was a very, very awful period. It was also a period of incessant war with what we now call France, and, uh, and Julian's bishop himself wrote off and participated in that combat as a bishop. So it was really a really terrible time for Julian. And this here is a map of Norwich uh, drawn in 1529. And if you'll permit me a, a scroll down memory lane, what's amazing for me about this map of Norwich, you can see the castle there and the cathedral there, and this is called Mousehold Heath, where people were martyred later on. This is the River, River Wensum flowing through the city. Um, if you look at this map, uh, if I look at it, I can see features of the life that I had when I lived in Norwich. So for instance, as I said, um, that building is the cathedral, and that is how it looks today. Right over here along the River Wensum, um, there was a pub right there called the Ribs of Beef, and in that circle is the house where Jane and I lived, right bordering the river. It's a beautiful place to live. If we take away that photo, 
I mean, I go to this place, and that was my the, the, my parish church. It was a church that I served in as an assistant uh, to the rector, and a beautiful a beautiful 14th century uh, structure that was meant to be it was built by the uh, shop owners of Norwich to rival um, the cathedral or attempt to. And if we take all that out and blow the map up a little bit, there's a cathedral again over here. If we were to walk down this road here, which is King Street, it's one of the oldest existing roads in England, and we get here, I believe that little tower is St. Julian's Church. And so you can see that my life in Norwich, I live just on the other side of the cathedral, and I would walk to the Julian Shrine where I worked as the director of the Julian Center, and also would walk in here to Corinne's daycare, was right about here, and to the counseling service, which is more over here. Um, all of this is my sort of my daily life. The Julian's Church still exists today. That's the view of the north wall. Um, it was originally an Anglo Saxon structure. This part here is Anglo Saxon, that's an Anglo Saxon tower. You can tell that because it was round. Um, this was added on, I believe, by the Normans. Um, but this whole structure is actually, has been rebuilt since World War II because it suffered uh, a hit by a bomb in the, one of the German air raids on Norwich. And the tower used to be twice as high, and they didn't have enough money to take it to its original height. Um, this wall was partially collapsed in the bomb, bombing, and you can see that, however, they were able to keep some of the Anglo-Saxon windows and restore them as they, they actually were. And this funny stone is called flint because there's no native stone to Norwich and Norfolk. So they built out of these hard pieces of flint they're able to get out of the countryside with a lot of mortar. That's a very common construction for that part of England. On the other side of the church, again, that beautiful flint stone, um, there is, uh, this is, this structure here uh, was rebuilt after the war over the place where they thought Julian herself uh, had lived. Um, as I'll say in a moment, um, Julian expressed her religious life not by becoming a nun, uh, but by being what's called an anchorite, which means that she lived her entire life uh, in, a, in a small apartment right here, attached directly to the parish church. And she was thought of something as the parish holy woman. And people would come and seek her advice through a window that faced onto the lane, while her lay sisters would bring her food and take away her refuse uh, through another window. And she had a third window which looked directly into the church. So that was Julian's, that was the place of Julian's cell. And they're guessing that because when the, when the, after the bombing, they found foundation walls sticking out at that place. And this is the typical place right up near the sanctuary where an anchorite cell would have been. This is a, a view of the inside of the church, a very small building. Um, and uh, this, this archway was incorporated from another church that was bombed in, in World War II. And it also is an Anglo-Saxon piece of architecture and you go through that doorway up on the side of the church and you enter into Julian's cell and it has an altar and it has benches for meditation and it has this other little devotional altar where people would come and light candles and people from all over the world would come as pilgrims spend time in there to pray and uh, and just be with with Julian in the place where she most likely lived for a great part of her life. Now, the question is, who, who was Julian of Norwich? Like, what do we know about her personally? And everybody thinks that she looks just like this, and she wore headgear exactly like that. Um, but that is adamantly not the case. Um, the reason why this is, such a, this is such a popular and all-pervasive image for Julian is that uh, Penguin Classics, when they published the Revelations of Divine Love, chose this image of an anonymous uh, late medieval woman as the, the, the image for uh, Julian of Norwich. So if we just dim down that image, I will say that we know almost nothing about Julian of Norwich. Um, we, we don't know 
what she was in her life before she became that anchorite living attached to St. Julian's Church. Some scholars argue that she must have been a nun, given her command of scripture and theology, it seems like it would have come only from being a nun. Uh, other scholars argue no, uh, because of her uh, tenderness and her use of imagery of, of mothers caring for their babies as images about how Jesus cares for us. She most certainly was a mother who lost her children and husband in the Black Plague. Um, other people say, no, 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 it's most likely that Julian uh, was a Beguine, uh, perhaps after losing her husband and, and children. And a Beguine was a kind of a devout holy woman who lived in community with other holy women serving the needs of the poor. And in fact, in Norwich today, there is still this place called the Britain Arms, which is this white building here, which was thought to be a Beguinage, um, the building uh, that would hold that was the, the, the home of this community of Beguines um, who would live together, pray together, live a devout life, and then serve the needs of the poor. And this great building behind it is actually, I believe, a Dominican priory. Um, I'm beginning to get a little rusty on my Norwich history, um, but it's a huge structure, and, uh, and I thought there might have been some connection between these two communities, the Dominicans and, and the Beguines. But the point is, I think, that we know really nothing about Julian of Norwich um, uh, from any kind of history or uh, outside source. All that we know about Julian is, in fact, what she tells us about herself in her book, the Revelations of Divine Love. And as you can see, there are many versions of this out today. There are uh, versions of the Middle English, because Julian wrote in Middle English. Um, it's fairly easy to read, kind of like Chaucer, but there's also many modern English translations that you can choose from. And almost all that we know about Julian comes from those books. We know that uh, uh, some wills left money for her upkeep in the 1415, 1416 kind of time, so we knew she was still alive then. and. We know that a woman named Marjorie Kemp visited Julian uh, to get spiritual counsel and wrote about it in her own book, uh, uh, her own spiritual autobiography. Um, and we know from that that Julian was widely regarded as a great spiritual teacher of her time. What the revelations of divine love tell us is that uh, when, when Julian was 30 years of age, when she was 30 years old, she had a near-death illness and she thought she was going to die and uh, the curate was, was sent for to, and he came to give her last rites. And he held before her a crucifix. And he said to her, uh, you know, gaze on this crucifix uh, to comfort you in your dying, which she did. And she then describes how over the next three days, she had a series of, I suppose we would call them mystical experiences. She called them showings or revelations, which opened her in a really special way to the love of God. And some of these showings were visual. She saw blood coming down on the crucifix that was held before her. She experienced Jesus in a way directly addressing her. She heard words uh, in her soul. And she also had experiences that she says she couldn't really translate into words. Uh, experiences of the bliss of God and the goodness of God, uh, which she struggled to translate for us. So Julian had these experiences, and very shortly after that, she composed what's called the short text, and she wrote about these experiences uh, as a kind of spiritual autobiography, saying, I experienced this of God, then this of God, then this of God, over the course of these three days. At some point after she composes this short text, Julian then becomes that anchorite living next to St. Julian's Church in Norwich. And uh, part of the reason that we know almost nothing about Julian and her life, apart from this book, is that when she became an anchorite, she took her name, Julian, from the church. Okay, so the church isn't named after her. She took the name of the church as her own, as a way of signaling uh, that she died to her old life, old life 
and had become simply the anchoress living at St. Julian's in Norwich. And that's why we can't track her back to any family or any convent or have any knowledge about uh, her life before she became an anchorite. So she becomes an anchorite here, which is the life of a holy woman of deep prayer, pastoral counsel for the church. Uh, some of my friends call her the first uh, Christian therapist uh, because she really was involved in pastoral counsel flowing from a life of the experience of God's love. And after 20 years of living that life and thinking about those uh, showings that she had when she was 30 years old, she comes out with, with, with uh, another edition of the Revelations of Divine Love, which is substantially longer and which is now called the Long Text. And it contains most of that original autobiography, uh, the short text, with, with extensive theological elaborations, reflections, and some new experiences added in and some pastoral counsel about how we live to God's glory in our time. So I think it's an amazing piece of spiritual literature because it combines both a first person autobiography, this is my experience of God, which was shocking and challenging and life changing, and then 20 years of theological reflection. And uh, the poets who love Julian say that also her language is just gorgeous and her way of writing is rhetorically complex and profound. Um, so I'm all for reading some Julian. And uh, what I'd like to do in, in the rest of this talk is to uh, explore some passages with you about what happened to her and, and with her. I need to get rid of that, that message. Hopefully it'll go away on its own. The heart of Julian's experience is the experience of a God of unconditional love. That's the whole point. Um, in a time when God's wrathfulness, God's anger was emphasized, when people thought God's anger was very evident in the destruction of their world as they saw it, um, Julian said no. God is never angry with us. God always relates to us with unconditional love and closeness, intimacy. Now, pastorally, it's possible to experience the love of God as if it were anger because of our own shame and our own self-rejection. That God's love can seem to be the last thing that we want. We want to keep rejecting and condemning ourselves. But... Julian says, the love is, is unconditional. We are held in love. We are enclosed in love. We are fed by love all our days, whether we are aware of it or not, or asking of it or not. But it brings special joy to God when we are aware of it and do ask for it and do seek it, right? And it deepens that relationship and makes it really flourish. So for Julian, the love of God is the main thing. God's joy in us, God's affirmation of us. And God takes special joy though and it deeply yearns for us to come around and receive that love and then respond to it and grow in relationship with it, right? And I had a friend who said, uh, he actually was the chaplain of the Julian Shrine for some time, Father Robert Llewellyn, who put it beautifully when he said that when we sin, we don't fall out of God's love, even when we're destructive and awful and, and cause lots of pain for ourselves and others. But when we sin, we fall into the aspect of God's love that he said is God's mercy, right? So it's God's mercy. Uh, and uh, for Julian, God's mercy is always like a mother's uh, care around us and seeking to support us and, and make us well and heal us and bring healing to us in our relationships. That's the, the bottom line of Julian, is that God loves us unconditionally this is shown to us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth who goes to his cross out of his compassionate care to journey with us into our suffering, into our death, so that God can be with us in everything. And, and it's also made real for us by what she called the secret gift of the Holy Spirit, which God gives to us to open our hearts to the reality 
of Jesus and what Jesus did and of God's love for, for us uh, for all time. So that's the heart of Julian. It's about love and uh, it's about refiguring the whole of Christian theology around a God who loves us unconditionally. Uh, because, for instance, if God is not angry, Julian says God doesn't forgive us because he never was angry in the first place. But how do we understand the whole experience of coming to God and seeking forgiveness? Um, what does that mean? And Julian works on that all the way through her revelations. And it's very profound. And for me, it's very, very transformative, very life-changing. Um, because it, it changed my sense of the spiritual life from having to get in the good with God or do the right thing for God or, or respond to God to uh, a sense that God was seeking to bring me into healing in my relationship with myself and relationship with others, right? And, and so my cooperation with God was about allowing God to, to make that healing happen. Uh, so it's a, again, it's kind of a therapeutic journey. Um, it's a transformative journey and it's a journey about love, as Julian says. So I'd like to look at some passages uh, that we find in Julian of Norwich. This is an icon of her uh, by a friend of mine. And if you look at the first passage, this is from chapter five of her showings. We have three of these. And originally I'd planned to give these out on pieces of paper for the parish and, uh, and you'd have the time to talk with your neighbor about the passage. But I think for this uh, video, I'll simply read the passage and offer some commentary on it. Um, the, the showings begin with, with Julian experiencing uh, Jesus in his passion, in his suffering humanity, uh, and feeling his pain very deeply as she sees him suffer. And she's aware that Jesus is suffering our pain, that we're suffering his pain, and a great mystery of compassion. Uh, but at the same time as that, that's happening, she also has a sense of God's great blissfulness and God's love for us. So the message of Jesus suffering with us is not one of guilt, it's not punitive, it's not shameful, but it's God saying, this is how much I love you, that I want to be with you and to share all your experience, no matter how uh, hurtful it is and no matter how sinful it is, that I'm going to be with you even when you get destructive. Um, and, and that's all based for Julian um, in a sense of God's, what she calls homely loving of us, that God just loves us as I said, unconditionally. And so in chapter five, kind of after that first initial showing of Jesus' suffering, she says this, at the same time that I saw this sight of the head bleeding, she's watching the crucifixion, our good Lord showed, me, showed to me a spiritual vision of his simple loving. I saw that he is to us everything that is good and comfortable for us. Everything good and comfortable. God is our clothing, which for love enwraps us, holds us, and all encloses us because of his tender love, so that he may never leave us. God is our clothing, which all enwraps us, so that he may never leave us in his tender love. And so in this showing, I saw that God is to us everything that is good as I understood it. And then Julian had this... Uh, her most famous showing. She writes, also in this revelation, he showed a little thing the size of a hazelnut in the palm of my hand. And it was as round as a ball. And in Julian's time, a hazelnut was like, was like snack food. You would eat them and throw the shells away. Uh, uh, as, as I know from a friend who, who found that when they excavated the Globe Theater, they found piles of uh, hazelnut shells underneath because People have just thrown them away as kind of like popcorn uh, hulls. And she looks at this thing, which is seemingly nothing, and she says, what can this be? And it was generally understood thus, it is all that is made. So she's seeing, as it were, a very small thing and wondering, how can that be? Um, how can it even continue to exist? What is this? But it's all of creation. So 
all of creation is seen as something very fragile, as being almost nothing, about to fall into nothingness. And she says, I marveled how it could continue because it seemed to me it could suddenly have sunk into nothingness because of its littleness. And I was answered in my understanding, it continueth and always shall, because God loveth it. All right, God loveth it, God makes it, and God keeps it, she says. And that's really, it's a really, for many people, a very comforting image um, that God is, creation is very small, very small. And yet God is around it with uh, endless love, endless care, keeping it, making it, loving it. Um, it sort of puts creation in perspective. And, you know, thinking about ourselves in this time of the virus, you know, that we were going to get anxious. And I, I've been anxious. I felt flustered. I felt like my... My life has been turned upside down with no church on Sunday and Corinne's school canceled and Jane having to deal with UNC being canceled in various ways and, um, and trying to figure out how to respond to the needs of the church. And um, it's, been a, it's been a disrupting time and an anxious time for me. And I imagine for most of us. And I think where Julian would say something about that with this image of the hazelnut, um, let's just go back to that. Uh, God all encloses us because of his tender love so that he may never leave us. And maybe we can make time. And I call this prayer when we just sit down and let ourselves be held by the love of God and be enclosed in the love of God. Because all that anxiety is not going to help us navigate these coming days. All the fear all the frustration at the way things are. It's not going to help us navigate. It's not going to help us grow in love. And so for me, and I expect probably for you, we all need time to let go of all the anxieties, all the news, all the social media, and, and come back to this more basic truth that we are enclosed and enwrapped by God. God is our clothing who in tender love will never leave us. And that's utterly true. And we just soak that up. And that's healing and restorative so we can go back out and minister to those in need. So this goes on, and the showings go on, and Julian experiences uh, in her first, the first half of the showings. Some showings are joyous and blissful um, so that she sees God in, in the third showing just radiating with joy through all of creation in a much more powerful sense even than this that God is this radiance of joy that's pressing through each moment of creation and affirming and rejoicing in in all that is uh, just as it is and then she has has revelations of God's deep suffering with us two different two different ideas but eventually that suffering comes really to the fore and it's called showing eight it comes around chapter 16 in the long text, and Julian enters very deeply into the showing of Jesus, uh, the showing of his suffering with us. And uh, as she sees him suffering, she feels that she's experiencing his suffering in her own body at that time. If you remember, she was in a near-death illness, so the illness of her own life and the suffering of Jesus on the cross are all mixed together at this point, right? And Julian's experiencing the compassion going in all directions, like the compassion of Jesus is opening her, opening, sorry, opening him to her suffering and her compassion for him is opening her to his suffering and it's all mixed together. Like Jesus is sharing his bodily self-experience with Julian, she's feeling it in her body and Julian feels that Jesus is experiencing the world's suffering in his body. So very intimate, very profound experience of compassion, which is another key mark of Julian. It is about God's unconditional love, um, but it's also about how that's expressed in compassion and openness to the suffering of others, which God experiences for us and we learn to experience as we journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. And 
part of this too for me as as a former therapist has been that um, people often aren't connected with the passion of their own lives and the suffering of their own lives and what Julian seems to suggest to me is that by being with Jesus because Jesus has already taken on our suffering that opens us to journey with him into a greater openness to the passion as it's already been lived in our lives. So part of this mystery of compassion, uh, strangely, is that knowing God and God's deep love for us and God's compassionate openness to us uh, means that we are drawn to be more open to ourselves and more congruent with our whole life experience, which is painful, generally, but also makes us healthier and more able to delight in life and more able to care for others. I and mean, that's part of this whole journey to Jerusalem, is this journey into the suffering of ourselves and our world uh, made because of a God who journeyed down to be compassionate and suffering with us. Well, this leads to a point of crisis for Julian because she feels she can bear it no longer. And at a lovely candid moment, she says, if I had ever known what I had asked for to suffer with Christ and to see his passion, I would never have asked for it. This is just too much, right? And then there's this passage, and uh, uh, this is from showing, uh, again, showing eight, chapter 19. Uh, before I go there, though, I want to step back and, and point out this painting, which comes from a piece of art that would have been behind an altar in Norwich Cathedral, during Julian's time, all right? So it's likely, maybe it's just possible, but it's, I'd say it's likely that Julian actually may have seen this piece of art um, and it was hidden for hundreds of years after the uh, Reformation and the Puritan Commonwealth and rediscovered and partially restored. But it's just very poignant for me to see how the people of Julian's time imagined the human body and even and the crucifixion of Jesus. This is what the kind of image that would have been in Julian's mind as she's thinking about and having a vision of the suffering of Jesus on the cross. Now, what she writes in, in Showing Eight in this chapter 19 um, uh, narrates what happened to her after she decided that it was just too much to be suffered with Jesus in this way. So what she's trying to do is she's trying to step out of that union of compassion that Jesus made with her. Um, it's kind of like a client in therapy saying, no more, I can do no more, I wanna take a break, I can't really be open to the suffering that's in my life, um, I need a break, <laughs> right? And uh, so Julian's saying, I need a break, I need a break from your suffering, Jesus, as I'm experiencing it, I need a break perhaps from my own suffering, um, I need some distance from all this. And this is what she writes. At this time, I wish to look up from the cross, right? So, um, because looking up from the cross would have freed her from the vision of Christ's suffering, and she, she has a sense that she could just look right up to heaven. But she says, I dared not, for I was well aware that while I gazed on the cross, I was secure and safe. And therefore, I would not agree to put my soul in peril, because aside from the cross, there was no protection from the horror of demons. So there's something there about, um, she feels that her only safety is in Jesus, who happened to be suffering at this time. And she's afraid to look away. She's afraid to disconnect from that relationship with him, um, because in some sense that relationship with him and that loving closeness with him, although it's very painful, is what keeps her safe. And there's something very powerful in that. Uh, again, in the situation of the virus, like how are we going to keep ourselves emotionally and spiritually safe, um, it's going to be by prayer, my friends. It's going to be by prayer. It's going to be by uh, listening uh, to the scriptures, uh, to reading them, to praying to God about how we're doing, to seeking out the accompaniment of others, uh, if not in person, by phone or card uh, or, or uh, video chat just to, to, to lock into our relationship with Jesus as the one who keeps us spiritually safe 
in times of great fear, in times of great unrest, right? That relationship, in a way, binds our anxiety and, and, and provides a way for us to journey through this time together. And it is about prayer. It is about talking to God. It is about reading scripture. But as I said, it's also about reaching out to other people and sharing this journey with Jesus and what is Jesus saying to you and how are you with that and what is God doing in your life. So enough of that. Um, Julian goes on. I had a proposal, however, in my reason, as if it were like a friend, which said to me, look up to heaven to his father. All right. So her, her, her reason says to her, well, why not look right to God? Why stay with Jesus? And the great, great, great pastoral priest and scholar, uh, Julia Gada, pointed this out when I was really a young in monastic life and said, this temptation to look up to God and away from the suffering humanity of Jesus is a temptation to a kind of spirituality that is about escaping the suffering of this world. And it's understandable that we want to escape the suffering of this world. But this is a spirituality of cutoff, of disconnection, of flight, of disembodiedness, of trying to escape from body, from history. Um, and these are really two different spiritual paths, right? In our journey to Jerusalem, we are staying in love with the person of Jesus, regardless of what that means. And he is our safety in our home. We're not trying to escape out of history, out of suffering, out of the body, but into our history, into um, the suffering that's there, knowing that Jesus can and will, in his suffering that with us, be able to open up resurrection and new life and new ministry through it, right? And it seems so important to me that the Christian life is about being deeply embedded in our history. Our history at St. Matthew's, with all of its suffering and sin, and all that comes from our own personal histories, um, history of Hillsborough, um, the story of our lives, that we're not escaping that into some kind of uh, transcendental spirituality. But the journey with Jesus, and even the contemplative journey in deep silence with him, is a journey into a deep holding of things, of these things, with God, and God holding them so that we can be, be healed. So Julian answers, uh, with all the powers of my soul, she says, and says, no, I cannot, for thou art my heaven. And this I said, because I wish not to look up for I, to heaven, for I had rather have been in that pain and suffering until doomsday than to have come to heaven otherwise than by him. For I was well aware that he who bound me so painfully, he would unbind me when he wished. So was I taught to choose Jesus for my heaven, whom I saw only in pain at that time. I delighted in no other heaven than Jesus, who shall be my bliss when I come there. So there's something here about Julian in which her whole emotional life and her emotional and spiritual health is, again, bound up in that relationship with Jesus. And staying in that compassionate place of connection with him, even when it's painful. And that when he is able to release her from that, he will. So everything for her happens in terms of what Jesus, in offense, would like for her, how he would like to share himself with her. And that is what she's uh, fundamentally committed to. So for me, this is a moment of deep and profound surrender. She just says, whatever. Uh, whatever, Lord, yes, uh, I must be with you in this and in whatever until you release me from this, until we transform this into new life and new ministry. I'll simply be here. And therapeutically and spiritually and just on a human level, that is the moment of transformation. Uh, when we accept our situation, then change can actually occur. Um, it's ironic and it's paradoxical, actually, that acceptance of our situation as it is, not saying it's good necessarily, but saying it's real, is what allows for us to change. And it's when we refuse to acknowledge the reality of a situation, some suffering or hurt, bad relationship, that we're locked into it, that it can't really change. We seek freedom from it in all kinds of ways, but we're denying it and locked into it at the same time. And and therefore we can't really change and grow, but when we accept its reality and we take it in, 
then there's a chance that we can begin to grow again. And for Julian, the whole journey of Jesus with Jesus is about this. And at this point in the showings, she makes this act of surrender. She thinks he is dying. And then in showing nine, he becomes all joyous to her. And she is filled with joy. And that's the resurrection moment in Julian's showings, the resurrection moment. And he says to her, it's a joy and a bliss that ever I suffered with thee, and I now share this with you, right? So it's saying in a way that that moment of surrender is in a way the moment through which we need to journey. That's our Gethsemane, that's our passion, out of which resurrection and new life and new joy can come. And that, I think, is absolutely true. Like, I don't, I don't see uh, any other way. Um, either from my reading of the mystics and the saints, either from the Gospels and how they talk about Jesus and Jesus as being the one who shows us how God's life happens with us, um, or my reading of therapy and my understanding of how healing happens in human life. It's all the same. So from here it goes on. Showings 9, 10, 11, 12 are all blissful. Um, Julian has a a further tangle with God for 13 chapters, wondering about how all things could be made well, given how bad they are. Um, you may have heard Julian's famous phrase, all shall be well. Um, well, God tells Julian that in chapter 27, and Julian argues with God about that for 13 more chapters, saying, no, things can't possibly be made well. Look how bad they are. And God works with her, basically inviting her to a place of trust and say, you can't know how they'll be made well, but you can't live well unless you believe that all things will be made well. And I think that's a really important distinction. Like we can't see and we can't understand how things will be made well. We have to live in nonsense, as it were. We can't make sense of that idea. But God is saying you can't really live well. You can't live as a person of love unless you take that as your basic frame and you live in that as the way you want to see and through which you want to experience reality, right? Very powerful stuff, very powerful stuff. And I look forward to having time with you in, in the parish to explore this at more depth. Perhaps next year I have a Julian class. Um, the last quote that I, though, I want to share um, comes from uh, chapter 49, and this Julian talking about how we are healed and how we are saved. Um, and uh, before I get there, though, I want to point out this image, which is in a stained glass window in the reconstructed, rebuilt uh, Julian Shrine. Um, they built, put this window in in the 1940s or early 50s, uh, which shows Jesus sort of on the cross, but the cross is the lily of resurrection. And that idea of, of the lily cross, of the Easter cross, uh, was so prevalent, actually, in Norfolk and uh, in churches there. And it's a beautiful image of Jesus, both cruciform in a way, resonant with his suffering on the passion, but delighting and full of joy, full of new life, and able to give that to us. I just think it's a marvelous, marvelously creative rethinking of how we see Jesus. And of course, as Julian phrase, all shall be well above the praying figure of Julian herself. Well, this last passage talks about there being no wrath in God, but also about, like, if there's no wrath in God, then what God's mercy and love is about is not slaking God's wrath, because there is no wrath, but it's about working with us to bring us with peace. And I'll just read this through. She says, I saw no kind of wrath in God, neither for a short time nor for long, for truly, as I see it, if God were to be angry, even a hint, we would never have life, nor place, nor being. As truly as we have our being from the endless power of God, and from the endless wisdom, and from the endless goodness, just as truly we have our protection in the endless power of God, in the endless wisdom, and in the endless goodness, we have our protection, which she calls in the Middle English, our keeping, uh, we are kept. We are kept, we are unfolded in the power of God and the wisdom of God and the goodness of God through everything that happens in life, from our birth, through our 
healthy times, our sick times, our joyous times, our sorrowful times, and the time of our death. Um, it doesn't mean we won't suffer. It doesn't mean we won't die. But in all those experiences, we are held and enclosed in the power of God, in the goodness of God, in the wisdom of God. And we're protected. That's what Julian's saying. But we feel different things, right? We don't feel that all the time. She says, we feel miseries, disputes, and strifes in ourselves. Yet are we all mercifully enwrapped in the mildness of God. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? That we can feel all these miseries and disputes in ourselves, but still we are held in the mildness of God. And in God's humility, we're held in God's humility, his kindliness and his gentleness. So that paints an image of me, which I know well, of being all disturbed by trying to get the kids out for, for school and things not being right and laundry needing to be done and, and things are all a jumble and I'm, I'm not happy and all that. And yet, Julian kind of sees all of that happening and yet alongside of that, God is holding us in, in, that, in that gentleness and that kindliness and, and that beautiful humility and just keeping us safe. And she writes, I saw full certainly that all our endless friendship, our place, our life, and our being is in God. Because that same endless goodness that keeps us, that we perish not when we sin, that same endless goodness continually negotiates in us a peace against our wrath and our contrary falling. So we're held in the goodness of God because we sin and we live in a sinful world and a destructive and a hurtful world. We ourselves get wrathful, right? God is not wrathful, but we are wrathful. We say no. We reject ourselves. We dislike our lives. We are angry. We're bitter. We're slothful. We're petulant. Uh, we despair. And, and around all that wrath, as Julian says, God's love is at work, sort of negotiating from the outside in, negotiating uh, with that angry wrathfulness and that hurt of peace. It's like God is always working at us to bring us to peace. And with the true fear, God makes us see our need strongly to seek unto God in order to have forgiveness with a grace-filled desire for our salvation. So even though like that goodness and tenderness and humility of God is always around us, caring for us, right, working on our hurt and our wrath and our anxiety and our pain, God still wants to do, do us to do more, and that is to turn and say, I need that, right? It's to consciously want that from God and to seek God, which restores us into a proper relationship with him and with ourselves. And it ends with, we may not blissfully be saved until we are truly in peace and in love, for that is our salvation. And she says something even more radical, a couple of lines on, she says uh, that when the soul is at peace in itself, then it is one to God. So when we come into a place of self-acceptance, being at peace in ourselves, that is, as I like to say, what God feels like. Self-acceptance is what God feels like and it's what Jesus does and it's what God does and the Spirit does in negotiating this, this peacefulness and this self-acceptance uh, in our wrathfulness negotiating that to bring us out of wrath into that kind of peace. So I hope that's uh, a little bit interesting. I realize this was a bit rough for a Sunday forum, um, but I hope that uh, if you had some time uh, on your own uh, during this strange period of social distancing, uh, when we are feeling quite anxious and quite uh, uh, disrupted, most of us, um, that maybe there is something in here for you to, to, to reflect on uh, about God's love, and soaking that up about God's great tenderness. And you know, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out uh, some passages from Julian in the next parish-wide email, uh, which will be coming with some frequency, if not every day, uh, to help us stay connected uh, in this time when we can't come together uh, as a community in person. Um, so Julian, I think, will look at us and say, oh, oh, people of St. Matthew's, um, this is a really hard time, and I can see how anxious you are, 
and how maybe angry you are this is happening and worried you are about yourself or other people. But, and all that is, is real, that's part of our human frailty that we feel these things and, and that's okay. And, but God has come right with us into that frailty and God is feeling all of that with us. And even as God feels all of that with us, God still wants us to turn to him so God can share with us some resource of love, closeness, and intimacy. So that this time, this time doesn't become for us a time when we simply get locked into anxiety and unhappiness, but a time maybe to grow in our sense of how deeply and richly God cares for us and loves us and accompanies us in all things. And, and that enables us to love each other and to, to be courageous and to do the good work we're called to do. Pray for me as I'm praying for the whole parish. Uh, pray for the staff. Pray for the medical doctors in our midst. Uh, pray for everyone who might be at risk in this. Pray for people vulnerable to losing their salaries, to becoming sick, to um, going to the hospital. And um, pray for us all that we may come together, hopefully by Easter time, uh, to celebrate again our common life in Jesus, this Lord who shows us how deeply and immeasurably and gently and humbly uh, God loves us. Thank you.